I said, I'm, my name is Joe DeMond of uh, the Biotechnology Innovation Organization. Um, we're pleased to be here with, at the, and working very closely with our colleagues at the EBD as uh, co-producers of this event. Um, we're the world's largest biotech organization. And um, aside from organizing events such as this and the Bio International Convention in the US, one of the core missions of bio is advocacy for our industry and policies that promote and facilitate biotech innovation. It's one of the reasons we were asked this morning to come to this panel. Um, in this role, uh, bio has become quite, or taken quite note of, and become quite concerned in the past few months uh, and recent years on the climate uh, for pricing for new innovative products. In particular, it seems clear uh, that uh, the pressures to demonstrate value and on pricing in general have intensified the world over, both in the US and in Europe. Um, I wanted to speak for a minute before we turn to our panel about some of the data points coming from a somewhat US uh, perspective on this. This could sort of set the table uh, for the discussion. Um, it seems clear that a year or so ago, uh, insurance companies in the US and payers were caught unaware uh, by a large increase, particularly in specialty drug costs. Um, 2015, 2016, a lot of that was driven by hep C drugs, but a few other big specialty drugs, uh, which has caused a reaction, which I'll come to. Uh, in addition, uh, there's been some high visibility price raising incidents, let's say in the US, uh, by Turing Pharma, and more recently by uh, Mylan with respect to the EpiPen. Uh, ironically, these were both generic products, uh, but the public doesn't really notice or care the distinction between whether a product is generic or innovative. They just notice that these prices are going up a lot. Um, what's lesser seen uh, is that there's been an active political campaign uh, going on in D.C. Um, in reaction to some of these price rises by uh, the insurance industry, by payers, uh, to focus the public on rising drug costs. Um, that's one of the reasons I think you see more media uh, on this. And there's been greater attention paid um, and greater prominence uh, by health technology agencies, health technology assessment agencies in the US um, working with payers, especially a, a group called ICER, the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review to which uh, Bio and other groups have been um, providing comments in terms as how they determine, develop their, their uh, their strategies. What this is leading up to is last but not least, um, drug pricing has become a campaign issue in the US this year, a rather big one, both in the primaries earlier this year, um, where it was raised uh, by both Hillary Clinton uh, and Bernie Sanders, uh, but also raised on the other side of the aisle uh, by Donald Trump. So it seems pretty clear that there is um, going to be some, there could well be some political fallout uh, to all of this in the US. And um, as David has noted already, um, this has already begun to have a real impact on markets uh, as we've seen downward valuations on, on the, the biopharma companies, large, large and small. Um, I wanted to talk for just one second then about what in the US the industry's response has been. The biopharma industry, including bio and some of our colleagues, um, has begun a major uh, public communications campaign to point out, among other things, the huge advances that have already been made in this industry, the millions of lives, the billions of dollars in healthcare costs that have been saved, point out the huge opportunities ahead if this if innovation is allowed to proceed, things like diseases like Alzheimer's, and the costs in, that would be saved as that proceeds. Secondly, with respect to the healthcare system itself, um, one of the things Bio is doing is noting again, reminding people that uh, healthcare costs or that drug costs uh, are still a small part of the rise in healthcare costs. Drug costs in the US have been pretty much a, a constant 14% of overall healthcare costs. That's not really changing very much, notwithstanding a blip last year. Um, we have to point out to people the cost and difficulty of biomedical research, you know, pointing out that, you know, for example, 10%, only 10% of all drugs that enter phase one clinical trials make it to, to FDA approval. Of course, the success rate's much less than that if you start preclinical or earlier. <laughs> We're also working to shed light 
on some other aspects of the healthcare system, um, such as the rise in insurance premiums, uh, the rise in co-pays that insurance premiums are, are um, putting on companies, um, the uh, PBM markups um, that uh, also can be reflected in what people are actually paying and the impact of all of these things on the cost of consumers. In other words, it's not just, the, you can't just look at the X manu the list price X manufacturer, but there's all these other parts of the system that are, that are causing and having an impact on drug pricing. We continue, we, we, we expect this debate to continue uh, obviously into the next year, regardless of what the election um, uh, results are. So it's been a very active, intensive time. I would say there's a great deal, a fair amount of, in the way, I think the word is anxiety in the industry, uh, in the U.S., but I think it's also global. It's with respect to what's happening, um, with respect to the public's perception of value, our ability to produce value, and the impact on pricing and the impact that this is then having on um, how our industry is being perceived and how the markets are valuing it. So with that as a preface, um, I want to introduce um, three very esteemed panelists that we're going to have today to help us uh, work our way through these issues and hopefully understand them a bit better. And more importantly, or just as importantly, understand what industry's reaction can and should be to some of these pressures. And also to discuss if people see the issue differently than the way I've just described it. Um, I'd like to introduce them. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Jörg Mueller uh, of Bayer. He's the head of uh, Bayer Healthcare Global Development since, 19, uh, since, 19, since 2014. But he's been at Bayer since the 1900s uh, for the last, um, <laughs> he's been in that position for 23 years, stretching far into the last century um, at, across a broad range of senior positions. Uh, secondly, thank you, Dr. Miller, for being here. Uh, secondly, I'd like to introduce uh, Kate Bingham, who's a managing partner at SV Life Sciences Advisors. She also, in addition to that position, serves on the board of uh, more biotech and healthcare companies that I could count. Uh, and I saw the long list in both the United States and Europe, and has also worked in business development for Vertex Pharmaceuticals, among other things, in her long career. And finally, I'd like to introduce uh, Jürgen Windeler, um, who since uh, 2010 has been the director of the Institute uh, for Quality and Efficiency um, in Healthcare, uh, known by its acronym ICWIG, which is one of the most important uh, health technology assessment agencies in the EU uh, and in the world, in fact. Uh, we're very um, honored to have him here today. And prior to that, uh, Dr. Vindeler had a long career as a scholar, uh, biometry and um, evidence-based medicine, and was also an executive um, at the Medical Advisory Service of the German Social Health Institute uh, in Essen. So thank you, panelists, for being here this morning. Thanks for um, uh, your patience for my, my introduction. And I, now I'd like to get the discussion started, uh, maybe just start with a simple premise question. Uh, and uh, I'll let you each answer it in your own way. Um, do you agree with the premise uh, that there is now more pressure than ever uh, for drug developers to demonstrate value with great rigor as a precondition to receiving reasonable access uh, and pricing? And if so, what are the main factors do you think that are driving this? And what's changed? You know, there's a feeling that things are changing or accelerating in this area. So who would like to answer first? <laughs> Dr. Vindeler. I'll try. Um, uh, with with uh, great interest, I heard your description of the U.S. situation. And um, for the European, and especially for the German situation, I would um, add that in Germany we have a kind of tendency, I would emphasize tendency, to um, increase the pressure on uh, pricing and on value. Um, compared to the US, I just learned, and compared to a couple of European countries, um, we have not such relevant financial problems in the German healthcare system, fortunately. Um, so there is, there is a tendency of increasing pressure and uh, increasing, uh, increasing the, the uh, interest in, in value assessments. I think there are three, um, three reasons, uh, 
couple of more reasons I'm, I'm mentioning three. One is, of course, there, is, uh, there are financial problems in uh, many countries in the world, uh, in Europe as well, in the US and other countries. So these general financial problems have impact on the problems, on the financial problems in healthcare systems. That's the one thing. The second is, I think there is an increase in, and there is an experience in the last couple of years, five years perhaps, that um, which, which perhaps uh, runs under the title too much medicine, that there is, um, that we do not need everything that is labeled innovation and is trying to come into the healthcare system. So this is not really a financial problem, this is really a problem of, uh, of innovations and what, do, what is their role in the healthcare system. And the third um, argument is quite simple, I think. There, is, uh, there are a couple of single examples where companies try to uh, get an extraordinary price from the system from their products. And these single examples, that's not in a general um, development, I think. These thing, uh, single examples lead to sc some kind of, of scandalize uh, these kind of mechanisms, these kind of pricing, these kind of, uh, of um, developments. Um, perhaps um, many of those who discuss these aspects do not really understand the background of all these uh, developments. I think these three, um, to, to my opinion, these, these three uh, developments lead to uh, some um, additional increasing pressure on um, um, establishing value and in uh, convincing the healthcare system um, of the value of the products. So can I just pick up on that, Jürgen? So actually it's not quite as uh, uh, unusual as you suggest. So based on a Leering study, um, they found 400 generic drugs over the last five years increased their prices by over 1,000%. Well, that's more than just a few. And actually, those are the ones that get the headlines. I mean, obviously, the EpiPen and so on. But actually, that is not helpful, and that is massively contrary to what we do. So our entire basis for being in this room and being in this industry is all about developing new innovative drugs that have significant clinical impact. And generic drug price hikes is clearly not helpful. And I think some of the spotlight on that and certainly some of the political discussions, if they put a lid on that, I think that's a good thing. And I think the focus then needs to come as to what is the actual um, value um, that these innovative drugs um, are creating in the healthcare system. And the challenge we have is, if you take the contrast between US and Europe, is in Europe we tend to have single healthcare payer systems. In the UK, as you all know, the NHS is the biggest single payer system, 120 billion pounds, which is probably about 120 billion euros now. <laughs> 120 billion dollars, it's all the same. Um, and um, so, so actually, you know, these single healthcare payer systems are in a much better position to be able to assess the cost benefit of these new medicines. And the challenge you see in the States is people switch insurance carrier the whole time and you have to negotiate separately. And there does seem to be less of a um, enthusiasm to really grab the sort of whole health economics um, in the States compared with over here. But, and I take one example. If you, if you look at the um, Novartis um, and Tresto uh, launch. This is a drug that is manifestly uh, clinically effective for patients and yet the launch in Europe was much better than it was in the States because there was stronger evidence for um, uh, benefit to patients and the cost saving by an overall system and that's not really available in the States yet and so until the US becomes a bit more joined up and figures out how to stop patients jumping between healthcare um, insurers, it's going to be very difficult and it's especially going to be difficult for some of these big, highly priced orphan diseases. A healthcare payer is not going to want to pay you know, half a million dollars or a million for a single one-off curative treatment if that patient then goes and switches carrier you know, three years later. So I think there are some issues to do with pricing and I think unusually uh, Europe is in a stronger position to get their arms around it. So I think from, from my perspective um a clear yes um, to your question. I think 
the pressure to demonstrate value clearly has increased, and, and both uh, Jürgen and, and, and Kate alluded to, to some of the reasons there. Um, and maybe let me try to bring it a bit closer to, to what I'm doing. Um, Bayer is an innovation-based company for more than 150 years, and as the one in charge for development um, of innovative pharmaceuticals, clearly the need to demonstrate value in the development process is increasing and has increased. Now, that's in my view not a problem in itself. Um, I think if we are able to demonstrate value, then we are in a good position. The problem is, and, and um, the previous speakers have alluded to that, the problem is that in the public discussion, the focus is less often on value, but rather on cost. Because if you focus on value, then you also talk about what is the benefit that is brought by innovative medicines. And if one compares, for example, and this is OECD data, in the last decade, life expectancy has increased by almost two years. And data suggests that about three quarters of that life expectancy extension has been attributed to innovative medicines. Now that is something that you don't find in the public discussion, which is often focused on, on the sheer aspect of cost. Now, the cost of medicines is, of course, not only driven by the cost of production, R&D, and so on and so forth, it is also including the value that a medicine provides. And you mentioned um, innovative hepatitis C medications. Now, these are very value drugs. They deliver a value because if you avoid liver transplantation, which can be um, a procedure with a very high mortality, but also costs a couple of hundred thousand euros or dollars or British pounds. And, and I think what we as the biotech and innovation-based pharma industry, I think, have to become better at is to engage also in a dialogue um, with other stakeholders to talk about the value we provide and, and get away from a pure cost discussion. And also, actually, in fact, if you look at cost of innovative pharmaceuticals in a healthcare system, and, and you mentioned some of the data, across basically most of the Western countries, we are talking less than 15%. Yeah? Um, the biggest chunk actually is hospital cost, um, which interestingly don't play a, a big role in, in the public discussion. And that is something I think um, if we are able to more talk about value, but also clearly demonstrate value in the R&D process, which is a clear task that we have, then I think we can also engage in a different dialogue um, with, with the public and other stakeholders. Thank you. Um, I was uh, struck by something that you, you said, Kate, and I wanted to draw this out a little bit because there's this um, assumption in the U.S. I go to a lot of bio board meetings where we have all of our members come and talk about their various um, issues and problems, among other things, um, that the last thing we want is for the United States to go the way of Europe in terms of price controls and, and uh, health technology assessment, that the U.S. still has competition in the healthcare markets, uh, that they're, the bulk of returns uh, for, for members uh, still in the American market. Um, that's why I think there's some fear about the direction of things I discussed earlier. But you seem to be implying maybe that, you know, this isn't, uh, that there, there's some benefits uh, or that maybe things aren't as horrible. Uh, in moving in that direction or some ways you said it was uh, actually better in some ways because of the, the very fragmented nature of the American healthcare system. I think this is something, I'm interested in, in, in um, getting, uh, discussing for a minute this, I, this idea that if there is a convergence, if the U.S. is moving in a trend that mirrors where Europe has been going the last uh, a decade or so or however long, that this would be a good thing or a bad thing for industry. 
so, I mean, I guess the other follow-up is the specific um, Californian proposition. Is that what you're talking about? So this that's is part, that, that's, that's an that's example. one of them. So this is called the Californian Drug Price Relief Act, which is to say that all drugs prescribed in California, which is a huge acquirer of, of pharmaceuticals, should be they should pay a price of no less than what the VA pays. Um, and it seems like it's going to go through, based on what I read. But what I think will also happen is then they will end up with drug shortages um, and then there will be a whole political cycle again to say, well, if we're going to put such a cap on costs and we don't get the drugs we want, well, then how are we going to end up? So I suspect there will be a, a, some sort of middle line um, agreed. I don't know if you, you guys agree because I think just going from free competition pricing where no doubt the U.S., uh, system is supporting innovation and pricing across the rest of the world. And that can't happen. We can't have America continuing to basically subsidize the rest of the, the world in, in drug discovery and drug development. But trying to take America right down to the base again and say, right, we're only going to pay rock bottom prices, I don't think that'll happen either, because I don't think the American public will accept any level of you know, uh, drug shortages or not being able to access the drugs they want. But I think this was going to be a very interesting political time to see what happens in California and then how that reflects policy. But I'd be interested to see what, what you say, uh, uh, Joe and, and oh. your, your Um Yeah, I think agree with, with your perspective. Um, I, I had the pleasure of, of living recently between 2012 and 14 in the US. And of course you see a public debate picking up in the US um, and you read it in the New York Times uh, and, and Washington Post about exactly what you described. Is the US funding um, R&D for the rest of the world? Yeah? And, and, and why would they continue to do that? Um, so I think um, I agree. Um, that is, I think, a valid question to ask. But to move away from free competitive pricing into something that you described will also have consequences. And, and we are seeing such consequences in other constituencies where that has happened. And I think we need to have a debate on everybody wants to live a healthier life, a longer life. Um, and innovative medicines play a key role in that. And you only get that if you maintain an attractive environment um, for companies taking on the very high risk of, of spending literally billions of dollars into R&D, um, they will only continue to do that if there is a reasonable expectation for an adequate reward of that. And my, my response would be similar. I think that um, there certainly is the sense that uh, the U.S. is still the greatest engine driving global innovation. Um, and you can look at any number of measures to determine that, to, to, to demonstrate that. And one, I think, one aspect of the debate that worries certain people is actually the cross-country comparisons that are drawn up in the debate, which is, look, look at the price of these medicines in the U.S., although admittedly, as I said before, the people are looking at list prices, which are not often a good indication of what actually payers are paying for the, and certainly not an indication of what consumers are paying, given the complexity of co-pays. But anyway, people will say, look at the price of these drugs in Canada, in Europe, and why are they so expensive in the US? Um, which, uh, if led to its logical conclusion, um, could end up, uh, you know, I think in the view of some, um, really damaging what some could consider the last bastion of support, the, or the main last bastion of support for innovation. You know, that uh, if the US were to adopt uh, a system of some other countries, then global innovation, other countries can, get, can do this to some extent, but if the US went in that direction, that somehow global innovation would be hurt. But I'm gonna come back to this, this issue. What I wanted to ask um, all of you to speak about for a minute um, is, uh, uh, as Dr. Mueller, as you were saying earlier, you know, that the companies have to, to uh, focus on the value of their products and demonstrating the value, it's a different question than simply what cost is. So the question that I wanted to put out there uh, to draw on that was what you think companies need to do that they're not doing now to respond to these trends. Um, you know, clearly there's more pressure on them to develop uh, different types of data. Um, 
uh, perhaps with respect to which products are even being developed. Uh, uh, Dr. Windler pointed out that some people feel like there's maybe too many medicines in certain, certain areas, certain on all of them. Um, what kind of data should be generated and when in the process? Um, and what kind of strategies, um, you know, how should we be thinking about strategies for bringing novel products to payers? Uh, you know, are things changing? Are things have to be done differently in the future than 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 companies may have been used to. What what do you, what's your what is your organiz, what are your organization what's your organization doing, Dr. Mueller? Or with respect to the other two panels, what are you advising companies to do? Now, Bayer right now is enjoying um, a period of growth that is driven by our ability to have introduced a number of innovative compounds um, to the market. Now, the interesting piece here is what is innovative and differentiated is not defined ultimately by us. It is defined by patients, by caregivers, physicians, and of course, ultimately also by payers. And, and so the challenge for us in an R&D um, environment that has long life cycles of 10 to 12 years is to be able to fast forward and think about what is the expected standard of care and 12 years down the road. Um, but also increasingly we are faced with the maybe even more difficult question, how will a healthcare environment look like 10, 12 years down the road? And now healthcare environments are basically driven by states, sometimes by regions, they are subject to political change. And you may have a situation where during the 10, 12 years that it takes to develop a new medicine, you have like two changes in government um, with impacts on healthcare policy. Now that makes it very difficult for us um, to work um, with our life cycles and take that into account. And then often you also have, of course, differences. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a common definition of what constitutes value. Um, also, those definitions vary from different HTA agencies, which for us um, makes it very complex. And, and the only um, way forward I see is, and that is what, what, what we do at Bayer, is we try to engage in a dialogue as early as we can in, in the R&D process. We also um, spearheaded um, the process that is able in, 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 in Europe where basically we have a tripartite discussion with regulatory bodies, um, with um, payers, to try to come up, okay, what is their expectation, what do we think we can deliver and need to prove, and then make that impact the way we develop new medicines and, and develop information that is able to answer the question, what is the value of this innovation you bring forward? I, I don't see any other way than that. Okay. Um, so, of course, as a, as a VC, we... Uh, can't be in the business of Me Too or sort of follow-on products because we simply don't have the resources <coughs> to compete with the big multinationals. So we have to focus on high-impact new medicines. That often means first-in-class, which obviously carries all the risks um, of doing that. Um, <clears throat> uh, and I guess the two aspects we think about um, which relate to sort of pricing and ultimate market uptake. The first is um, clinical. So are we actually able to have a material effect on the outcome of that patient's life, whether it's survival or, cost of, or quality of life itself? Um, and that tends to be where we will focus. So very clear, clinical, measurable endpoints to show superiority over um, standard of care. And yes, exact projecting out into the future what that standard of care might be in five or 10 years. And the area that we are spending more time thinking about, but uh, hasn't really um, played a big role in our early clinical studies is in the financial impact. So uh, can we show that by using this drug you can actually lower 
this healthcare system's overall cost, because ultimately I think the payers are going to want to see both, so that if you can show the clinical advantages, does that actually deliver a, a financial um, improvement to the overall cost of managing that patient? And that's something we're thinking about, but we haven't done a lot with it so far. Yes, um, I, I acknowledge the, the difficulty of uh, um, a development uh, on 10 years or 12 years. That's very difficult to, 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 um, to, uh, to develop. But um, I, I would like to, to comment on the first in class. I think that's really, that this is really um, a an, an relevant, relevant um, point of development because we had um, about a couple of three years ago, I think, um, we had in Germany, we had the eighth statin in the system. And we had a discussion in the Federal Joint Committee about uh, um, the, this, the statin. We have to, we have to um, um, take it into the system. But the patient representative asked, do we need the eighth statin? No, of course we don't. We, perhaps we need three. And I think this is one of the, uh, of the, of the tasks that uh, the ph pharmaceutical industry has to discuss at least, uh, that, we, that the, the questions will, will, um, uh, will come, that um, what, what is, what is the, the, um, the, the new, the, 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 uh, what, is, what is actually new with this new system? Do the system needs this new, the, the, this, this drug? Um, this, this is one, one um, uh, argument, one discussion that has to, be, has to be focused on, I think. And the second is, of course, the answer of, for, from the, the head of an HDA institution, we need data, we need convincing data from convincing clinical trials. Uh, we don't need promises, uh, we don't need simple claims, but we need convincing data, not only on mortality, but of course on morbidity, of course on quality of life, very difficult discussion, of course on, uh, on uh, decreasing the, the number of adverse events or anything else, anything that, that, ca that can be called clinical benefit. Perhaps you know that in, at least in Germany, at least until now, the discussion about financial benefit doesn't play any real any role in the, in the discussion. We, we are talking about clinical benefit and we as an HDA institution, we have to rely on and we want to see convincing clinical trials. So Jürgen, I'm just interested in that. So what was your response to the eighth statin? What, what do you, do you approve it? Do you reimburse? What, what, how do you it's, think about it? We, in Germany, we have no possibility to not reimburse these, uh, these um, drugs. There is no mechanism of not reimbursing drugs um, apart from drugs that are dangerous for patients. There's, all other drugs are reimbursed in Germany. There may be an impact on the price level of those. Yes, it is. Yeah. So, and, and that's an example that, that I wanted to provide actually. Um, um, it also um, um, went through the news we had in, in our portfolio an oncology compound that in the th setting of third and fourth line colorectal cancer had provided a survival benefit. Um, the ICVIC ruled that um, that benefit um, wasn't of a sufficient size um, and then the GBA basically um, expected a significant price reduction that led um, Bayer to withdraw the drug um, from the market in Germany. We continue to provide access, um, of course, for patients that are on the drug. But now we have the interesting situation that with the same compound, we have now for the first time ever a survival benefit in second line liver carcinoma. No other drug has shown that we just submitted that um, uh, compound um, globally some days ago. And I am told that in the current system in Germany, because that ruling has occurred in a previous indication setting, there's no way not to now come back and, and reassess that um, on the basis of new survival benefit in a, in a different indication setting. So I think that, that is, again, 
a discussion that I think we need to have also in the public domain because some of the procedures that are put in place run the risk of depriving also patients um, of, of innovative medicines. So, yeah, are there other uh, legislative changes to deal with that? Because that seems crazy. Um, I'm not really, really involved into the, in the discussion about this liver cancer uh, uh, drug and this liver cancer uh, approval. Um, I, so, I, I don't can co I cannot comment on that. But um, for for the uh, for the for the discussion about colorectal cancer, I would like to emphasize that the pharmaceutical company that the pharmaceutical company decided to get this off the German market. It was not the German system. That's what I said. Well, let me, let me ask this then. Um, there seems a, potentially a, a bit of a dilemma here. Um, Dr. Vindler, you pointed out that perhaps uh, Germany does not need an eighth, or the world maybe, does not even need an eighth statin. There's seven perfectly good ones out there and they've been around for a long time and several of them are generic so the price is very low you know for the comparator product um, but you, on the other hand health uh, healthcare payers benefit a lot from the fact that there are eight statins or at least several of them because without that there would not be a lot of comp price competition in the marketplace and i'm i'm wondering if that if if by uh, turning thing making things too tight or making the added value uh, assessments uh, too stringent, that you begin to create a disincentive to actually putting competitor products out there in the market because people are going to determine, the market's going to determine, well, we're not going to get any, you know, even a second or third line product, maybe not get very much uh, uh, compensation for this, in, in which case you're stuck with the first in class, or maybe one or two products, and you don't get the benefits of the competition. Now we have, again, statins is a good example, SSRIs, you know, for antidepressive drugs, there's six or seven of those on the market, um, and these are all become very, now, a decade ago, by the way, or 15 years, there was a lot of complaint about statins, if you recall, and there was a lot of complaint about SSRIs, but now they're all dirt cheap. Um, and I'm wondering in the, f in the future, because of what's happening in the marketplace now, um, we won't be able to reap those benefits from competition because people just aren't going to have the incentives to develop those competitive products. I think a very important point, I mean, I mentioned increase in life expectancy. Now, that didn't happen like all of a sudden we woke up and the average life expectancy increased by two years. We are talking about incremental increases and um, we also have data suggesting that, for example, in oncology, both in the US, Western Europe, we have seen a reduction of mortality by about 20% across the board since the 1990s. Also, that didn't happen from one day to the other, but we are talking about incremental improvements. And um, also, the eighth statin can provide an important improvement over the seventh and the sixth and the fifth. Yeah, I mean, not just because a compound is associated to belong to a certain class, does it mean um, they are all the same? Um, we do have seen differences in the efficacy and safety profile of these drugs. And I think we need to be careful um, exactly to your point to say, well, anything that is uh, not first in class um, um, will face difficulties because there is benefit of best in class compounds and um, Nobody can determine what will be the best in class of a given compound. Yeah. So, uh, of course, the eighth statin can be um, better in some aspects than the other seven. And I would like to see the data. I would like to see the convincing clinical trial that this is the case. That's fair. So, uh, that's very that's very simple. And I would I would uh, the second point. Uh, I'm not sure that there is any added benefit concerning the competition aspect of this eighth statins concerning perhaps the fifth or the sixth. I'm not, I'm not uh, arguing for only first in class, of course, but I'm arguing against um, the uh, sixth or seventh or eighth only for, with the aim of competition without any added clinical benefit. Because, and you sh I think we should not forget that, these drugs, the fifth and sixth and eighth and tenth, are of course um, um, and financial 
problem for the system, not only in paying the drugs, but on, on paying the organization of approval of um, uh, post-marketing surveillance, of all the, the, these things that are, that, uh, that are in the responsibility of the, of the society. And this is easier, of course, for a small number of drugs than a large, than a large number for the same indication. And if there is no clinical added benefit, I think this, this, the system can and should ask where is, where is these drugs for. But Jürgen, I think the example you gave will also be an economical problem for the company that brings that forward. Yeah? So I think coming back to what I said earlier, for us it is of critical importance to be able to characterize what is the value, what is the innovation, um, because it makes no sense to spend um, a vast amount of money on something that is not differentiated ultimately. That is not only a problem for, for society, it's also of a course. problem for the investor. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the problem is, as you said, I mean, no, nobody goes into um, a, a project to develop an eighth line treatment for, for cholesterol, right? I mean, you, would, you, you don't know that until like, you have the data. And then, um, but, and at some point, uh, I think more and it's more, I think this is, goes to the question earlier about what country, companies should be doing this. I think more and more uh, companies are shutting down those projects earlier if it's becoming clear that it's not adding uh, sub substantial clinical benefit. Well, yes and no. I think what it means for the R&D process is that you cannot really wait until you have basically your phase three data in hand. I mean, you need to have a basis that allows you to say, I have a reasonable chance with this molecule to improve on not only what is out there, but also what I see is occurring um, in other developments. And if that question cannot be answered with a yes, then I really would suggest um, you have a second thought whether you really take that forward. So it's all about designing, if you can, crucial experiments as early as you can in the R&D process to allow you to pick the winners and avoid spending some on something that ultimately has no chance of, of being differentiated. So just to echo that, so again, as a, as a VC, we typically will go from uh, late lead up through to phase 2A, 1B, 2A um, in patients. And so for us, and that's the point typically we would then transact, we would not typically take our uh, drugs to market and do the, the pivotal studies. So we need to basically create as strong a package of data um, to that point so that we can be sure that actually our drug is, is working in the mechanism that we uh, think it is in patients that will then deliver that clinical benefit. Mm -hmm. And it really matters for us because, as you all know, the way Big Pharma buys our companies is we'll get something up front, as we saw in the stats, something up front, and then we'll get earn out payments based, you know, the buyback payments based on successful development. So the stronger the data package we can have at that earlier stage, the more likely we are to receive those payments. So we spend a ton of time thinking about, well, what is the trial design? Can we use adaptive? Um, uh, approaches? Can we stratify the patients? Have we absolutely nailed the translation from the preclinical models into patients so that we can be as confident as we can in, in the data pack? Now, clearly, if you are dealing with first-in-class uh, targets, uh, lots of things are going to fail. But to the extent we can be more intelligent about how we actually develop those drugs at an early stage, that has massive uh, positive benefits on us. And so in terms of what are we doing to change, we are for sure uh, probably spending a bit more uh, time and money and resources thinking about those early clinical studies than we used to. So you're saying you are getting a bit more rigorous with respect to what you're asking companies to provide? For sure. Yeah. For sure. And, and this is not just you. This is a, a trend. I think it's across the industry. I think across all the VCs the industry, are doing it. Yeah. Across the industry. Um, so... I, 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 let's let's take a step back then. Um, so you, you're asking for more. Um, uh, certainly, the the health technology um, uh, assessment agencies like ICWIG are asking for more uh, before um, uh, they'll uh, be able to certify that it actually does provide um, uh, additional clinical benefit. And so things are getting rigorous. 
um, more rigorous. And of course, there's the polit as I said, there's this whole political overlay, you know, in terms of just what the absolute price is. I think we all we can agree, at least some of us can agree, that the absolute price of, uh, is not really the measure to look at. It's actually the value, you know, that the drug is providing compared to other healthcare innovations or to the healthcare system in general. But um, the question I have is, what impact do you think this is is having or could have on the the ecosystem of innovation itself. Um, is this going to have, is this going to fundamentally change or some, in some way significantly change the business model or the business models that companies look at, um, the numbers and types of investments that are, get, are getting made, uh, uh, the projects, I mean, David put up, you know, trends. And, you know, we have these, generally the trend, I mean, this is a down year, uh, but the general trend, uh, you know, since 2008, because of the science advancing has been, um, upward, uh, but you know, is that going to continue? Are these economic pressures uh, or uh, some of these imperatives going to have an impact on, on um, the, the way the the, the way in a, the pace of innovation, I should say, and the business models in the future? Well, I don't see a fundamental shift or change of the business model, but as I tried to describe earlier, I think it will require more scrutiny on where do you invest and basically trying to design the R&D process in a way um, and of course that's the um, $64,000 question since eternity um, that allows you to focus your resource investment on drugs that hopefully have the ability to provide a meaningful benefit once you've gone through the complete registration process ultimately. Um, in terms of changes on, on the business model, there I see more maybe a risk coming from a different direction and that is um, with better understanding big data approaches, um, if we gain more predictive ability to be able to say who will benefit, um, ideally also to what extent from a certain drug, and who shouldn't get the drug because he or she may have either less benefit um, or um, run the risk of, of having side effects. Um, the ability of accessing such information, I think, in the long run may have um, the capability of shifting um, the business model um, of, of the innovation-based pharma industry. Um, because then, coming back to the value, um, the value is the value of the information. And if the information is held someplace else, then of course part of the value um, will, will go there. So I think there is actually a bit of a change in the business model, which is, Sitting where I sit, we see much more uh, interest from pharma coming in to either to our companies at a lot earlier stages. So not just the corporate venturing funds, but uh, actual rela relationships, collaborations uh, to really tease out some of the novel science that can potentially be translated into high impact clinical medicines. And I'll give one example is the uh, fund we launched uh, last year, the Dementia Discovery Fund. So that was cornerstoned by six pharmaceutical companies together with the charity Alzheimer Research and the De UK Department of Health. And that was a recognition that the current in innovation process for trying to develop drugs for dementia that were actually altered the course of the disease rather than uh, symptomatic treatments, the current model isn't working. And so this is an example where the pharma not only put up uh, their money, they cornerstone the fund of $100 million uh, so far, um, uh, but they actually also put up their heads of neuroscience, neurodegeneration, to actually help advise the manager, which turned out to be us, to um, think about, well, what are the new areas of science? What are the breaking areas? What, what are the different pathways and targets that could be tractable to actually lead to diseases, uh, 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 drugs that can actually alter the course of the disease? And that is a very different model. The idea that you've got six pharma companies with no commercial rights sitting in a room together collaborating to, to figure out, well, what are the new ways we can actually do 
business. That is something that I've not seen before in any uh, uh, biotech sector, and I think it's incredibly positive because what we do need is is shared not, shared um, expertise and learnings. Because it is crazy to think that our little companies that that we support are actually going to be the uh, the best at at you know a certain area without the benefit of some of the learnings that and experience throughout the industry. So to the extent we can actually share earlier in in ways that make commercial sense for the different stakeholders, I think is 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 really helpful. Does do you see that connecting at all with the, there's also a drive for companies to um, to demonstrate greater transparency with respect to their, their tri clinical trials and evidence? Um, uh, you know, in order to sort of avoid uh, uh, having others recreate the wheel. Um, but then again, you know, companies have traditionally done this because their commercial you know, reasons why you would want not necessarily yeah, so, to share. Yeah, so we would, we would always tend to um, publish. Um, I mean, obviously, we want to get the IP so position sorted out. Mm -hmm. um, and we will publish our failures, as well, as, of which we've got plenty, um, <laughs> as well as, as the successes. So, I mean, I do think it's helpful to publish. And I think we should all be held to that standard that um, we don't want to waste dollars. We don't want to waste patients' time and dash aspirations by retesting mechanisms we know don't work. So I think I think publication of data is really important. Obviously, remove whatever is really commercially sensitive and publish at a time which is um, um, reasonable and for the for the actual business that you're running. But I think fundamentally, should we be publishing clinical trials? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, we fully support um, transparency both when it comes to clinical trials, uh, when it comes to publications. Um, and, and I think um, we welcome the development that has taken place there in recent years, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Vindler, I wanted to ask you um, how you see your role with respect to the, the innovative process. I mean, do you see your role strictly as assessing the added clinical or therapeutic benefit of um, of new medicines that come out of the pipeline, or do you see that you have a role in actually trying to foster and facilitate the innovative process itself, or is that not your business? Um, our major business, of course, is uh, assessing the, the benefit, added benefit or value of uh, new drugs or medical technology, of course, it's not only, it's not only drugs, um, uh, when they uh, Come into the the it, in, in my in my place the the German healthcare system or the European or the US system, but um, I think we we try we see our 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 um, tasks uh, in the in the develop in the um, um, in trying to give advice concerning the process of coming into the system. Not perhaps in 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 um, improving the 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 the, uh, the and, and enhancing the the, the the innovation process, but in in uh, giving advice and telling how uh, what are the requirements for the European or the German system for new for uh, innovations and new developments. Um, there is there are a couple of, of structures such as the early advice structure with the with the EMA in the in the European uh, on the European level, um, but I think the uh, I think they are quite quite interesting. I'm not sh really um, aware and sure uh, of the of the value of these early dialogues for the pharma pharmaceutical companies because um, um, w w with my with my information from these processes. There are, and, and what, what, what you can imagine of, of these uh, advice processes, there are a couple of, and I think most of the advice um, is what you can see from, uh, from our assessments or what you can read somewhere in the literature. That's not quite new, uh, in the, the content of this advice. Um, but um, I think th I, th it seems to be a valuable process, uh, at least, and manufacturers seems to uh, seems to uh, like this this uh, this process. So we we are we are giving advice. We're trying to to give hints for the development and for the for the uh, successful way into the systems. But we do not feel responsible for the development process in itself. Thanks. 
Um, I wanted to ask a, a, a bit about the pricing um, system itself, and, and focus, let's focus first on Europe. Um, the getting a, getting a value assessment from an HTA agency uh, like ICWIG or NICE uh, or, or one of the other major ones in Europe is really just the first step of the process, right? The countries in Europe still all have national healthcare systems, and they all still have national pricing systems. One aspect of those systems is, is um, they all refer to each other uh, in terms of the prices. So Germany's price, which is uh, uh, based on ICWIG, but not the, the, the next step, um, is then used as a reference price for many of the other markets in Europe. And then those prices are then used and referred to by um, other countries. And there's this, there's this um, uh, uh, feedback mechanism. It's, it's, if you've ever seen the diagram of who, cr of who refers to other countries' prices, it's incredibly complicated, both with, with respect to Europe um, uh, and the world. And I'm just wondering if you have thoughts about the impact of this, because it's all very well and good for us to talk, you know, in terms of the data, the clinical data that's available, you have to show value. Um, of course you do, it all sounds very rational. You get a product um, that, that uh, provides some clinical benefit uh, beyond what's out there in the market, but then it goes into this system, you know, this complex system of countries referencing each other's prices and uh, deciding that they want the lowest price of three other markets. Uh, so uh, that's a lot less rational, I guess, and I'm wondering if what your thoughts are about the um, uh, and much more confusing, what your thoughts are about that, that whole system, the way it works now. And can I add a question, because I think you guys are going to be answering it, not me. Um, is how do you deal with that when you've got standard of care, which is so different across other countries, so where the actual benefit to patients could be very different? That's exactly what I tried to allude to. Um, we are dealing basically with um, many different HDA um, assessment systems, we are dealing with many different healthcare systems. Um, the landscape there is much more fragmented than the regulatory landscape, um, and, and that is a challenge for us. I mean, coming back um, to, to, to the point you made, um, for us, differentiated pricing is very important. Um, and um, for example, it provides also the opportunity which we use to have lower prices in poorer countries. Um, and, and therefore it is connected to access um, to medicines. If you have a system where basically um, you have a one price across the board, you take away that ability to differentiate. Um, and therefore I think we need to be careful that we um, don't have sort of like a very self-centered um, view on the world, but there is um, significant geographies that have a different economical standard and they have an equal right also to have access to innovative medicines. And, and the ability to have differentiated pricing is, is, is a key ingredient for that. I have nothing. I have nothing to do with pricing, no. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, the the pricing is done by the federal uh, by the health insurance fund in 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 Berlin com in in negotiations with the pharmaceutical companies in Germany. So I have nothing to do with pricing. I, I've uh, I'm 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 very interest. I'm I'm with interest. I heard the the discussion about what is what is let's say what is better for for the manufacturer and the pricing um, a central system and uh, or a widely separated system i think you said that the the us system is, is separated and the sep se the separation is a problem for pricing now um, in in uh, europe of course we have a separated system in the uh, in the certain countries um, so we at, and at the moment we um, um, have a development, at least discussions, quite interesting discussions um, from pushed by politics together with manufacturers to harmonize the uh, European system. Um, now, I, I would like to, 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 to uh, from coming from the, from the, from the uh, view of the uh, US system, 
there seems to be a problem for pricing after the harmonization because then there is only one player. Um, and of course, after an after harmonization of the HTA process, there should be a harmonization of the prices. Um, I'm not quite quite sure whether there, whether the 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 line of separation of the system is is better is better for the healthcare system is better for manufacturers is better for innovation uh, or whether a, a centralized uh, system with central prices perhaps um, is uh, is a better position for the for for pricing. That's a good question. Well, one, one thing I think that's, that's come clear about, I think when we were commenting about the US earlier, is one issue I think that people recognize is that the bodies that are paying for drugs are not necessarily, the and assessing the value of drugs are not necessarily the bodies who are, will be realizing the cost benefits down the road to the healthcare system. So you can make the case to an insurance company that um, in five or 10 years, the morbidities and, and uh, comorbidities will be reduced and that the cost, therefore, to healthcare will be reduced. But if that payer is not then insuring that person, for example, if they're going on to Medicare when they turn 65, then they may not care about that and they may not have an incentive to, uh, to reimburse the medicine. Um, that's different under a more um, a unified system. Um, however, I think we also see uh, in some countries, it really depends on how the internal mechanisms of the healthcare uh, system work. Um, some countries have um, separate out the payment uh, of medicines from the payment of healthcare. And so um, there may be benefits to other parts of the healthcare system, but uh, the healthcare payer, the, the pharmaceutical payer, for example, a country far from here, New Zealand, has Pharmac. Pharmac has an annual budget for medicines. That's their budget for medicines. Do they care what, do they necessarily care what the benefits to the, down, down 10 years from now to the healthcare system are? They don't necessarily care. So those are some issues, I think, structurally that might need to be addressed. And there's another um, related issue, which I don't know how many people uh, read the article last week that Manny Pangloss wrote from AstraZeneca, basically saying, uh, sort of letter to Theresa May, saying, if you don't sort out pricing in the UK, you're going to lose innovation because there is a link to uh, being able to have that uh, industry and environment of creating new innovative medicines. And if you can't then actually sell the uh, drugs in your own home market, well, then maybe the innovation will move away. And I think that's another angle that comes in at the side as to how do you think about pricing if, if the two are related. I, I tend to think they are semi-related. I don't think they're completely related, but I think they are. Uh, related so that the, the people thinking about pricing certainly need to pay attention to how can you actually uh, retain an, a vibrant, innovative R&D industry. Would, um, so one thing we know, you know, both, both the United States and Europe have their own complexities. Europe is complex, the United States is complex because we have a multiplicity of payers, um, and insurance plans, uh, et cetera, states. Um, Europe is complex because it's 27 countries. Um, would, would there be benefit to, so let me go back to the, the issue of health technology assessment because I think uh, industry is adapted to that and uh, uh, Dr. Vindler, you're heading one of the larger health technology assessment agencies in Europe. Um, I know there's talk about greater collaboration among the HTA agencies uh, in Europe. Um, and I think there's a bit of a debate going on in the industry about whether um, this is something to be desired, uh, you know, the eventual more centralization, as you were saying, more centralization of this, or whether having um, different agencies, um, you know, with different national data, for example, and different healthcare systems doing assessments um, makes more sense. On the one hand, um, certainly there, there are certainly efficiency advantages of having a centralized determination within Europe and in terms of collecting the data and all that. On the other hand, um, uh, maybe one size doesn't fit all or, or companies would prefer having choices or not have to live and die on one determination. That's quite a scary thing. I'm just wondering what your thoughts, any of your thoughts are on that, on the greater centralization of, of HTA within, within Europe. Yes, there is an example for, for uh, centralization, of course, that is the approval process. Mm -hmm. um, in my opinion, the approval process is completely different from HDA because it is kind of an, abs an, an abstract theoretic, uh, dis theoretic decision 
with practical consequences, of course, or for the manufacturer and for the healthcare systems. But it is, an, is a, it is abstract from the uh, from the um, s particular um, healthcare systems. So the HDA process is within the healthcare systems. That is, in, in a bit, part of the cultural and political systems of the of the um, uh, of the um, co um, uh, nations. So. <laughs> Um, so we, the, the, the healthcare system are quite different, very different within, within Europe. So I think there is, um, uh, it's very reasonable to discuss the um, uh, harmonization of processes. It's very reasonable to discuss the harmonization of methods, the harmonization of standards. It's not very reasonable to discuss uh, joint work in, in a way that there is only one product in Europe and everybody um, has to has to take it and um, perhaps in, in some kind that kind of uh, discussion to have some centralized European decision about uh, reimbursement within the uh, within the member states. I think that's not not very reasonable. I think as an industry we benefit from clarity and stability, and of course there would be, in my view, a benefit from such a standardization. However, as I think Jürgen um, pointed to, um, I'm not sure I'm going to see that during my professional um, lifetime. Yeah? Um, and, and, and the reason we're, we're pointed out, um, we have national, sometimes regional healthcare systems. And so I see it, I mean, we, we all see the struggles in the European Union level. Um, making a political union drive with an economical union or vice versa. And uh, in order to get to that, you would really need to get into the nitty gritties. Um, and I don't see that um, happening um, right now. Now, failing that, of course there would be a benefit if we could agree on harmonized methodologies, harmonized standards, um, so I think that already would be a great benefit um, if we could agree. But also there I'm skeptical because also methodologies and what is important is driven by what healthcare system do you have and, and, and therefore what are the factors um, that drive you um, to consider efficiencies um, and, and, and standardization in the respective system. So, um, I have to say, I'm, I, I would very much welcome it, but I'm skeptical um, that it will come in the foreseeable future. So we've got a new um, announcement that came out, I guess, a couple of weeks ago called the um, Accelerated Access Report. So it's something that John Bell and Hugh Taylor worked up in the UK to basically say, well, uh, why, why are we so slow to take up um, new innovative medicines? and how can we get these both to patients quicker and paid for more quickly. And so they've proposed a much more streamlined approach where a lot of the sort of reimbursement discussions and clinical um, activities are happening in parallel. Um, so you can get early conditional approval, early um, approval on, on reimbursement subject follow, but with followed up um, clinical work. Now to the extent, and that is again in a closed system, so to the extent that sort of real life uh, data collected alongside clinical trial data can be published and shared. I think that can be really helpful. It certainly doesn't address the differences between the different healthcare systems, which I think is completely valid. But another useful data point, I think, is helpful in the whole discussion. Okay. Thank you. I think we're about out of time. I have another big list of questions here, and I, um, but we don't have time for them, and we um, want everybody to make sure that they get their lunch. So. Let me, uh, please join me in thanking our panelists today for what I hope you found was to be an interesting discussion. <laughs>